Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're tuning in from. Um, I wanted to get on here this morning to uh, share some amazing testimonies of what God has been doing at the hotel. Um, so in one day in particular, two women were saved. Uh, I came outside and there was a man and a woman sitting on the curb. And the woman had asked me if I had $5. So I asked her what the $5 was for, and she told me that she needed an Uber. And um, I told her, that's that's no problem. I could call an Uber right on my cell phone. Um, and, you know, they would come pick her up in minutes. But she said, no, I don't need the Uber right now. I, I actually need it at a, for a later time. And I told her again, that's okay. We can, um, we can go onto the Uber site. And you can actually pick a later time in the day, and then we'll pick you up at that time uh, right out in front of the hotel. And um, she then proceeded to tell me she wouldn't need the Uber until, until tomorrow, until the next day. So then I offered to meet her in the lobby the next day to do the uber for her and and kind of kept getting the runaround so the lord was letting me know in that moment um that she she wasn't being 100 percent truthful and then she proceeded to tell me that her her partner her boyfriend uh was an alcoholic and that she's really just trying to take care of him again that part was true but she left out the part where she was an alcoholic as well and so the lord was kind of downloading that into my spirit you know she's not being 100 percent truthful she has a problem too so as i'm talking to her and i'm trying to figure out you know what her beliefs are i find out that she does believe in jesus christ i find out that she grew up catholic i find out in conversation that she has a son who doesn't believe in God at all and he's LGBTQ and that is uh, heavy on her heart at the moment as well. She knows Jesus is coming back. She believes that. So as I was talking to her, the Lord said, have her rededicate her life to me. Now sometimes we can backslide for so long and quench the spirit for so long that we can be given over to our own depravity we can be given over to the sin that we are choosing right because God gave us free will he's not a forceful God he's a loving God he's not going to force you to have a relationship with him but I don't know why you wouldn't want to because there is no one that loves you more than the creator of everything you see around you than Yahweh than Yeshua HaMashiach than Emmanuel God with us than Jesus Christ. So I tell her, the Lord is putting it on my heart right now. He wants you to rededicate your life to him. So she says, okay. So we say this prayer. And it, it starts off a little something like this. Lord, I believe. This is the confession first. I do believe. That you walked among us as a man on the earth, God incarnate, God in the flesh. In the person of Jesus Christ, and I believe that you died on a cross for my sins. And I believe three days later that you rose from the dead. And I want to rise. I want to rise to new life with you. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Take away the stain of my transgression. Take away the guilt. Take away the shame. Make me a new creation. She said something along these lines. Make me a new creation. Teach me your ways. I want to learn from you. I want to know you for myself. Not who man says you are. Not who I, I, I learned you to be. Not even who the church or a pastor says you are. I want to know you for myself. Show me who you are. Forgive me of my sins. I humbled myself. 
I make you my Lord and Savior. As soon as she said that, the Lord also had revealed to me that she had unforgiveness in her heart. I said, we need to deal with this next. You have unforgiveness in your heart, but the Lord says that you can come to him when you are weary and heavy laden and he will give you rest. 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 Peace that surpasses all understanding. So the Lord told me what was there. She had bitterness. She had resentment. She had anger. She actually laughed at a couple of things. She knew probably who they were towards and why. But she freely handed them over. She said, take them out of my heart. I don't want them here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for grieving your spirit. When she said that, her, she said her heart started to ache. That was the spirit manifesting in there. Her heart started to ache. And it scared her a little bit. But the Bible says God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. So the Lord had me place my right hand right over her heart. And as he was speaking out of me words of comfort and consolation, be still. It's okay. Don't be afraid. This woman went from frantic and hyperventilating because she was feeling this aching pain in her heart to calming down little by little by little. like only the Lord can do. Only Jesus can do that. Take somebody from a frantic, hyperventilating state to complete peace. And so he told me, I said, what's in, what's in her heart? Rejection and death. So I broke the generational curses of rejection, abandonment, and death. She was delivered from all three. She started coughing. She started crying. And the whole time, the Lord is just giving her words of encouragement through me to tell her all will be well. You have no need to be afraid. I'm right here. After this experience, what this woman did next, if repentance had a visual, if we could see repentance on video and say what does repentance look like what does it look like to be cut to the heart by my wretched condition by my sin keep in mind this woman was about 52 she'd probably been drinking for a very long time and it had probably taken a toll on her body and that spirit of death was at work to try to drag her to the pit but Jesus stepped in and said not this one not this one. She was mine before. And she will be mine again. And the father drew her just like he did the first time. Hallelujah. He drew her just like he did the first time. This woman threw her head back. And for about a good solid eight minutes. Jesus, 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 help me. Jesus, 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 save me. Jesus, 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 I'm sorry. Jesus, Jesus, help me, please. Help me, please. Jesus, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I can't do this without you. And she just kept going. I can't do this without you. I can't do this life without you. Help me, please. Save me, please. She said, I will serve you for the rest of my life. So I walked over to her boyfriend, who was a little stunned by what he was watching transpire, but he didn't know how to feel about it. And I talked to him for a little bit, and he told me that he had a brain injury. He hurt his head. He hit his head pretty bad, and he had a brain injury and all kinds of health problems. And he had been drinking for a long time. And he battled with depression. And he battled with anxiety. And I said, you know, I told him the gospel, just like she had just confessed. I said, God really did walk among us. I'm talking about the, the God of the universe. I'm talking about the God 
who created you, me, everything we see around us. And he's eternal. And no one created him. And he answers to nothing and no one. And yet he humbled himself in the form of a servant and walked among us on the earth for 33 and a half years. And I told him, I said, you know, sickness and disease, it was, it was never even supposed to be a thing. What had happened in the garden with Adam and Eve is that they wanted to be their own God. They wanted to be like God. No one can be like God and you for sure can't be your own God. That never ends well. When you try to be your own God, when you try to be Lord over your life, don't be surprised if you keep crashing into walls because that is exactly what will, will, what will happen when we step outside of God's natural order, his will, his way, and his plan. And his plan is always going to be a thousand times better than yours. A thousand times better. So as I'm talking to him, he goes, he's, he's listening. He's listening. I can see that the seeds are being planted. And then I told him, I said, and as far as your sickness, I said, God wants to heal you. He could do it right now. But you got to humble yourselves. You got you got to make that confession. And God, God will heal you if you will let me pray for you. He'll show you how very real he is. He doesn't need to prove himself, but he'll do it out of his mercy and he'll do it out of his grace. Because Jesus Christ bore all our sicknesses on the cross and he carried all our diseases and by his 39 stripes, by those lashes that he took for you and for me, we are healed. Not we might be, not we could be, but we are. Does God sometimes allow sickness for his glory? Yes, he does. But in this case, I really believe that he wanted to heal this man. But there was a barrier. There was something in it. It was like this big wall and I couldn't get past it. And I'm like, Lord, what is this? Because he said, I want to believe you. I want to believe you. That sounds good. But I just don't know. And then the Lord placed it on my heart. He doesn't feel deserving of healing. He doesn't feel deserving of healing. He doesn't feel like he deserves it. So I asked him outright, do you feel like you don't deserve to be healed? He said, no. No, I don't. And I said, why not? And he called himself a loser. And I said, you're not a loser. You're not. Don't say that. I said, who said that to you? He said, she did. <laughs> and she said, she said, I'm sorry, I can, be, I can be rash with my mouth sometimes. And I said, it's, it's okay, I, I understand. I said, we all can. And that's something that God needs to teach us, right? Is to speak graciously and to season our words with salt and not, not to be so hasty to let things roll off our tongue. So I said to him, you're not a loser. That's a lie from the pit. And he just hung his head. And he looked so sad. But he wasn't ready yet. How many of us know how important it is to be on God's timing? He wasn't ready yet. So instead of handing him a Bible or pushing any more of God's word onto him, I just gave him a little card that had, you know, some encouraging words and a prayer, I think it was like a slight prayer, but it's, it's scripture. And some scripture verses on the back if you flip it over. And he flipped it over and he looked. And he folded it up and he put it in his pocket. And I felt a little sad for him. But it was almost like this Lord gave me, the Lord gave me this reassurance. I'm not done. I'm not done. He's going to be mine. The next day, I came outside. Mm -mm -mm. I came outside. It was a beautiful day. I was going to just go worship on the curb, right? When, when you first pull into the hotel, there's this little grassy curb that I worship on. And I don't care who's watching. Because who knows? Who knows 
who's being touched by that and transformed in a moment. But my worship is for the Lord and I worship in spirit and truth. And I know the power of that worship. So I'm not going to hide it. Because God's word says don't, don't, don't hide. Who hides a lamp under a basket? You're supposed to give light to everybody in the house. In the house, in the apartment, in the condo, in the hotel where you are. Wherever it, are, it, it is, you're supposed to shine that light. Hallelujah. So I didn't approach him and I didn't even see him, but he saw me first. The same man. And he said, you're still here? Now, he doesn't know, but I knew that was the father drawing him in that moment. So I got to speak to him for another 35 to 40 minutes about the gospel. And this time, he was locked in, engaged, listening to every bit, every word. I knew those seeds would be, plant, would be planted. And I always pray against Satan snatching the seeds that are planted. I always pray for that seed to be watered immediately or on God's timing. But I also pray for a harvest of righteousness to come from any seeds planted. To cover all the bases. So there was like that, that amazing conversation that took place. But I will tell you this. For anybody who wants to share the gospel. For anybody who wants to evangelize. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And the spirits in a person get very agitated. Once you've given them the truth, once they've said the, the, the prayer that's inviting Jesus Christ to come be Lord of their life, once they've acknowledged their guilt and humbled themselves and repented of their sin, the spirits get very agitated and so they manifest. So he went in, but he came back outside. And when he came back outside and I was walking past him again, the spirit. How do I know it was a spirit? It's really simple. That spirit manifested and was very vulgar in that man. Why? Because he was already drinking. It was first thing in the morning he was already drinking. Drunkenness will open us up to the spirit realm. Drunkenness will open you up to the spirit realm. Angels and demons. Okay? And so... You'll, you'll be able to see both is what I'm saying. You'll be able to see things that you wouldn't normally see. And so he opened that door to a demonic attack. And this spirit speaks out of him the, the most vulgar, like profane things. And I was going to ignore it. But he said it again. And a boldness rose up in me. And I just walked over to him. And I pointed my finger right at his face, but I was addressing the spirit. And I said, you, the spirit that is speaking out of him, shut your mouth in Jesus' name. And this man dropped his head like this and said, okay. But here's the thing. It wasn't him. It was the spirit. Because every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every knee in the heavens, every knee on the earth, and every knee under the earth will confess him as Lord, whether they want to or not. Because he was given the name above any other name. And demons flee at the sound of that name. Yes, I can use Yeshua as well. Because that's Jesus Christ. They know who I'm talking about. As long as I say, in the name of Jesus or Yeshua, you could even use another name. But as long as you know who you're referring to, the one true living God, Emmanuel, God with us, the Holy One of Israel, they will respond. And if you are being harassed or bullied by a demon through another person, you don't have to stand for it. 
You can use the authority you are given in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Yeshua, or whatever other name you want to use, as long as it matches up with some language. And the translation is this. God incarnate. Jesus Christ. The only God who ever died and rose again three days later. The only God who ever died and got back up. And so, going back to the day before, later on that night, on the opposite side of the hotel, as I'm walking around and I'm worshiping, this woman kind of smiles at me, but I was drawn to her immediately. I was drawn to her immediately. It's like the Lord was saying in that moment, go. Go, speak to her. So I sat down on the curb, and she was smoking weed. And she said to me, I just had to get out of there. Talking about the hotel room. Because sometimes you can feel like a caged animal. If you're in the room all day, you don't have a car, and you got nowhere to go, and sometimes people will get depressed. There's a lot of people in here that battle with addictions. There's a lot of people in here, um, in here that are either trying to escape domestically violent situations or they're in one there's a lot of I would say probably 90% of the people that come in and out of here are homeless so I'm talking to this woman and I said to her I said yeah I understand I get it you just want peace right you just want want some peace she said yeah I said what if I told you I know the Prince of Peace and she jokes, and she says, um, well, then I would say send him right on over. And I said, don't make me get my daddy. Don't make me get my father. She laughed again. So we're having this conversation. I'm just trying to figure out what her life has been like, what she's been going through. So she tells me that life has been really hard. She's been alienated by her family. They don't get along. She feels like she has nothing and no one. The people that she has trusted have let her down. She's had a lot of loss and grief in her life. Haven't we all? Uh, but she told me at one point that one of her eyes, she could barely see out of one of her eyes. And I said, what happened to you? She said that she was mugged in um, the next city over. And... She also admitted that she knows that God's hand has been on her life because there's certain things that she shouldn't have walked away from. She was hit by a truck. She was hit by a truck, and she walked away from that. And I said, oh, so then you know. You know. You know that God is real. You know you shouldn't have walked away from that. But his hand was on you. And he said, no, not today, not her. It's not her time. But I did talk to her about how our life will eventually come to a close. Our life is going to eventually come to a close. And I told her my testimony. I told her how I was on the fast track to destruction. I told her that the choices that I was making in my life was just spiraling me further and further downward into this pit. But I also told her that there is no pit that he cannot dig you out of. God can reach in any time and pull you out. He can do it. And he will do it. But we have to humble ourselves. We have to admit. I've tried it my way. I did all that I could. I've been looking for you. A lot of them have been looking for God. But in all the wrong places. Jesus is the way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way to the Father. No one gets to the Father except through Him. And God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is the Godhead. And so there are no alternate pathways. 
You can't get to God through planets and stars and studying them or worshiping them. You can't get to God by worshiping the universe. You can't get to God through good vibrations, positive affirmations. That is not how we connect with the Lord. He is as close as your own confession. He is as close as your own confession. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus is God incarnate. If you believe that and you confess with your mouth that he is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And repentance follows when you truly believe. I'm going to say that again. Repentance follows when you truly believe what you're confessing because God knows whether you do or whether you don't. God knows whether you do or whether you don't. Some people make that confession just because they want to avoid hell, but they don't truly believe it. Because if you believe that Jesus is God incarnate, and that God, the almighty creator of everything you see, walked among us as a man for 33 and a half years and went through everything we ever went th could ever go through rejection abandonment he was abandoned by his own disciples when he needed them the most he experienced shame on a whole other level when they stripped him down to nothing naked in front of a bunch of roman soldiers and then beat him like a dog spit on him gambled away his clothes while he hung there on a cross Jesus knows. He knows how you feel. He is not some faraway God. He knows how you feel. He knows what you're going through. He knows what that feels like because he lived here in this fallen, broken world for 33 and a half years. And he not only did it so that he could reconcile you back to God back to your father in heaven but he also did it so that he could relate to you and understand what you're going through on a personal level because we serve a personal God every other false religion in the world does not have a personal God many of them don't even think that God speaks or that they can speak to him but we serve a personal God. He wants to counsel you. He wants to be Lord of your life, ruler of your life, governor of your life. And he wants to lead you. He wants to lead you in the way everlasting. He wants to lead you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He wants to counsel and guide you and keep your feet from traps and snares along the way. Because you will have opposition. When you hop the fence from darkness to light, you're going to have a lot of opposition. That just comes with this walk. So I find out that this woman used to battle with alcohol really bad. And she went to go see a hypnotist. She went to go see a hypnotist and she stopped drinking. But... She stopped drinking and picked up all these other ailments and all these other afflictions because that's how Satan works. Satan comes as an angel of light. Oh, look, you've been healed. But a hypnotist is not of God. And a hypnotist opens doors to Satan. So one of the things that the Lord told me is she's going to have to renounce that. She's going to have to renounce hypnotism. And then she tells me that uh, she grew up Catholic. As a child, she doesn't remember much about it. So because she doesn't remember exactly what she may or may not have done, the Lord said, have her renounce Catholicism and Catholic practices. So I had her do both, and she did it without hesitation. Again, the Father was drawing her. Some people would have asked questions, why? What for? Doesn't that mean I'm a Christian? 
Catholics will identify as a Christian. However, I'm going to say this lightly. I'm not saying this lightly. The majority of them do not have the Holy Spirit. I do believe that sometimes the Lord will use the Catholic Church just to get somebody to start to learn about him. But eventually he takes them out of darkness into his marvelous light. Why do I say that? Because they pray over rosary beads. Okay? And that's an idol. And Catholicism is full of idols. And they also pray to dead saints. And they also venerate, which means to worship Mary. That's what veneration means. It means worship. And my Bible says we are to worship the Lord our God, and Him only shall we serve. And my Bible says that we are not to speak to the dead, pray to the dead, feed the dead, none of that. And that is an abomination to God. It's an abomination. Baby baptisms. A baptism is supposed to be done in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But the age of accountability is 12. This is something the Lord recently put on my heart. And he reminded me that Jesus entered into the synagogue and started listening and eventually teaching at 12. 12 is the age of accountability. Anything before 12 years old, getting a, a baptism the majority of the time, unless that child is, is, is highly intellectual, they may or may not understand what it means to be joined to Christ. And it's very important before someone is baptized that they understand that. Right, And so a child, a baby, does not know what it means to be joined to Christ. Now I know I'm going to get some backlash for that, but that's quite all right. Because I'm here to tell you that there have been several people, several, in the past four months that have been delivered from Catholic practices. And those demons left. And those curses broke. And they are doing a lot better since they walked away from that belief a lot better. Hallelujah. Because anything that's works-based means you remain under a curse, means that you are stuck under the law of sin and death, and we're under grace. We're under grace. We are saved by God's grace through faith. It is no works of our own. When we start to make it about what we do, when we start to make it about works, we have believed in a gospel that is no gospel at all. We have believed in a different Jesus at that point. And so when people renounce these things and they come out of agreement with them and those curses are broken, they are delivered. And I have heard the spirits audibly scream out of them on the way out spirits of legalism spirits of error spirits of double mindedness and the big one that can be found in a loveless and a dead church a spirit of condemnation or accusation that's a big one Satan is the accuser of the brethren so you renounce these things and then the Lord put it on my heart. I'm going to heal her eye. Tell her what I tell you. So I looked at her and I said, The Lord wants me to tell you this. He's going to heal your eye. And God says, I'm going to do it gradually. So I told her. The Lord said he's going to do it gradually. He's not going to do it right away because he wants you to know it was him. He wants you to know. He said, tell her I'm going to break every destructive habit that she has off her life. So I told her, this woman starts weeping, weeping. 
And he finishes by saying, your, your latter days are going to be greater than the former. As soon as I finished saying that, I told her that our pain is not in vain. And God's going to use every bit of what she's been through for his glory. And she's going to go to people, much like I'm doing with her today. She's going to pull them out of darkness into his marvelous light. And people will listen to her because she's lived it. People will listen to her because she can relate. People will listen to her because they know that she's not, she's not making this stuff up. They'll see the evidence. They'll see the evidence. Amen. And so that woman got saved as well. I'm going to tell you one more. <laughs> oh, God is so good. So I was outside um, one night with this woman and I have talked to her uh, numerous times and she's been in the hotel for about as long as I have, about a year. And, um, you know, that some days are easier than others, but she was just feeling really discouraged and uh, she had something uh, show up on her breast, like a bunch of uh, cysts, she said. It was a bunch of cysts and it was painful and it made her feel almost deformed and she was just really down about that and so i talked to her and i said um, this is the same woman uh, for any of you that remember this testimony um, who was healed of crohn's disease so i said well you remember what he did you know jesus is still performing mighty miracles today just like he was doing two thousand years ago so let's pray and let's believe for it and see what god wants to do and then he put it on my heart, have her rededicate herself to me as well. So she did. <laughs> she did. She rededicated herself to the Lord. Um, I also had him, I had her ask him to do an inventory of her heart. And if there was any unforgiveness there in whatever form to forgive her of it and take it out of her. And, um... She explained that her legs started to tremble and she felt kind of like lightheaded, like, oof, you know. Uh, but she noticed right away that the soreness, as I was commanding healing to be released into the afflicted places, the soreness and the discomfort went away. Now, I don't, I don't know about the, the growth itself or the cysts. I do believe that God's going to heal her from that. And I pray that I'll be able to get on here sooner than later to tell of how he, he worked yet again another mighty miracle because of his mercy and because of his grace. Not because we've earned anything and definitely not because we deserve it, but because God is good. Amen.